Very, um, very good question because um, that will demonstrate to you what the, the faith of the Muslims is based on. Because as Muslims, we have a foundation of our faith. Yeah? We can't just believe in things just because I think it's right, my gut feeling. We have to have a solid foundation what makes us Muslims, what gives us the identity of a Muslim, and how we should live as Muslims. So Islam has some fundamental sources which is the source every Muslim should follow, okay? The primary source is the Qur'an, the speech of God, the speech of Allah, okay? So everyone has to accept that, yes, this is our primary source because God has given the revelation in his speech, verbatim, through the Prophet Muhammad to us, telling us who he is, who we are, what we're supposed to do, what's going to happen to us after life and death and so on. Now, if the Quran, which is the speech of God, were to explain every single details, the Quran is not going to be about the size of this book. It will be huge, right? Okay. So instead of this, the Quran tells us that the Prophet وسلم, the Prophet who is receiving this Quran is going to explain to the people the tubayyina, it's called kibyan to explain and clarify to the people what God has said for example God says in various places throughout it's a common thing of the Quran establish prayer for God you know? establish prayer if you ask yourself how do I do that Allah hasn't told us, oh, first you have to stand and then go in prostration. You have to say this three times or then sit down and come up and then end it with the salam and so on. Sure. That kind of detail yes. is not given in the Quran. But, right. but the Quran does give in occasion where it sits fit about the forms of part of the prayer. For example, you prostrate or you kneel down or you make glorification of God. Okay. But the actual sequence and the details and so on, which can be easily explained by a prophet. Yeah? So the prophet's role is to explain the Quran. He's to explain it. Because the Quran is not the speech of the prophet, not even a single letter. His explanation is somewhere else other than the Quran. Obviously, because it's not part of his speech. So that explanation of the prophet, whether he explained something or he agreed on something, approve something or disapprove some things okay his speech and actions they are also documented and transmitted to us that documentation is called the sunnah the teaching of the prophet the sunnah is compiled in the sunnah yeah so now you have the quran and the sunnah, the sunnah. teaching the prophet explanation of the prophet this sunnah has been transmitted to us in living actions, the, you know, actions people have can see and so on, but they have been also transmitted in books. What the Prophet said, what the Prophet did. His words have been now transmitted by writing. And we those know that, words, sorry, those words. Yeah, I'm just about where, to explain. Where, were they written yeah. when the Prophet was so alive? So these words were written even at the time of the Prophet Initially, they were written at the same time as the Quran was revealed. All right. Then the Prophet noticed the people are writing the Quran and his statement side by side. Now it's going to create some confusion. Because how do you differentiate which is the word of God and which is the word of the Prophet? So the Prophet forbade writing the statements of the Prophet at the time the Quran was being revealed. But later on, he uplifted this uh, prohibition. This is now you can. So there are many companions in our literature we can find that came and said, Oh Prophet, can I write this? And the you know, Prophet allowed them to write. So, they, they, they got their hadith written down. So hadith, which means speech, yes. is a terminology that is used for the statements of the prophets, his actions, his approvals, his disapprovals um, uh, that the prophet said and did. And that has been taught and transmitted by the people and they're codified in books. Because when people started writing, then you can have something to refer to. The Quran wasn't only transmitted in memorization, it was also written down. But the Quran was then taught to people by a teacher. The teacher would tell you how to read the Quran. Okay. So there always this accompaniment. Likewise, you have this hadith. The hadith has been narrated 
and transmit it in written form as in verbal form. So they got written down anyway. Eventually, all of the statements of the Prophet, the hadith, got written down. Now, what happened is this. Like every other culture, there were people who didn't give the importance of, you know, saying things accurately for their own benefit, for their own whims and desires, right? So these people somehow felt, oh, I need to justify my position in political authority, for example. So I'm going to invent a statement of the Prophet, Hadith of the Prophet. And I'm going to say, the Prophet said this. Now this was happening quite early, right? People noticed, what? Prophet said this? How do you know? Uh, tell me, who, who did you hear it from? Because obviously you did not hear it directly from the Prophet, because Prophet passed away already quite some time ago, right? Name me your men. So this whole science called Isnad, the science of Rijal, of the people and the, uh, the biography started coming by asking, who are you transmitting information from? You said the Prophet said that, okay? You were not at this time, so who told you this? Oh, from X, from Y, from Z. From Fulan, from Fulan, from Fulan, we said, fine. So people started looking at, okay, did you, okay? But the person that you're seeing, that you said from, you haven't even met him. You've never met him. So that statement, we would say, we were classified by the scholars. Now we are authenticating these statements. This is not acceptable. This is not authentic statement of the Prophet. Because now you are narrating from someone which you did not even listen from. So, so there are hadiths which are not regarded as authentic by Muslims. Yeah. So there are hadiths which are clearly proven to be fabricated, forged, and there are hadiths which are classified to be authentic. Now hadith comes in different types. One type is looking at the number of people transmitting, and you can have you know hadith which is like khabar ahad, or hadith which is mutawatir, a large number of people transmitting this hadith of the Prophet Islam in from different localities and different people, these are the most strongest in terms of their credibility. Yeah? Because so many people narrate it. Imagine now, I am going to... We, the discussion that we have is going to be transmitted to some people, right? Sure. If you have one... We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people, right? If you have seven people narrating the same thing, and one person narrating the different thing, you will say, look, all of you heard our discussion and you narrating some a particular statement differently of an addition so we will look at you and say okay fine about your character are you a person who's always speaking the truth or not if you don't speak the truth out of the window your statement is not acceptable because we don't take acceptable statements from people who have known to be lying and deceiving now suppose that he was a person who was known to be always truthful and trustworthy. How is his memory? Was his memory good? Did he hear it correctly or not? All of this, you know how they categorize the hadiths? Well, I, I understand that, but what yeah. I, I wanted, I understand. I, I will focus I, from on From a religious it. perspective, I understand the Quran reading it. Yeah. But are Muslims then meant to read the hadiths alongside the Quran? Yeah, I'm coming back to this point. I want to give you the background of the hadith. So if that gentleman narrated something in addition to that, we will say this is called a shard, ziyad at the a an addition of a trustworthy narrator. But all the others, you know, when they agreed to, in the jurisprudence eyes, they will take precedence. Because all of them heard, and you added something extra, which is not found by others. So hadith was started to be classified like this, depending on who narrated, how many people narrated, the people they narrated, what was their character, what was their memory, did they suffer in memories later, were they influenced of any kind of a theological you know, uh, motivation and, 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 and leanings and so on. So we have categorized books which are clearly authentic. Some of them you probably heard the names, like Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih al-Muslim, Muwatta of Imam Malik. Okay? Muslims don't doubt about this hadith. Why? They have been rigorously authenticated of the people who narrated them. So Muslims, when we want to know what the Prophet said or did in relation to something, we would go to these sources because we have confidence that this is what the Prophet said. Some other hadiths are categorized and authenticated to be weak. So we will say this is a weak hadith. Okay. So when it comes to taking weak hadith into certain aspects of things, there's lots of different rulings. 
do you take weak hadith in your aqidah, for example? You can't take weak hadith in your aqidah. Aqidah means your belief. You can't take something in your belief which is based on a hadith which are doubtful. Yeah? So this is how hadith comes in. So Muslims will go to the hadith because that's the explanation of the Prophet. And the Quran says, if you truly love Allah, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي أُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ Continue the ayah. يَغْفِرُ لَكُمْ ذُلُوبَكُمْ Yeah? Yeah. Um, this is the, how the ayah goes. If you truly love Allah, then follow me, follow the Prophet. Allah will forgive, love you and forgive you all your sins. So Muslims will go to what the Prophet said and explained. So our hadith literature, the ones that are authenticated, we are confident, this is what the Prophet said and the Prophet explained. We will go there and we will take that in the source of our religion. We have no problem whatsoever with this. Okay. And in fact, if you become a Muslim, you would also think that this is what I should do. How did my Prophet explain it? Because the Quran says, pray. Now, what am I going to say in my prayer? The Prophet, for 23 years, he demonstrated in every single day how to pray, what to say in the prayers, what to say when you bow down, what to say when you kneel down, what to say when you make, you know, ending your prayer. He demonstrated that a living example. So the Prophet has to be followed because that's where we know the explanation comes from of the Quran. Okay, I see. You really, I need help Sorry, I've been a little, little bit more in okay, detail, I, but that's no. to show you the background. I understand. And then you have specific hadiths which you're meant to follow. Bukhari and... Authentic ones. Authentic we should all follow the authentic Those ones. are the two main ones. No, Bukhari these are... Or, or so, Bukhari, in terms of authenticity of classification, Bukhari is undisputed. All right. Then the next level will be Muslim. Yeah. And Mu'atta of Imam Malik. And then you have other hadith books. Okay, what Imam Bukhari did, just to give you an introduction, there were so many Sahih hadiths, meaning authentic hadiths around. He was going to compile a mukhtasar, which is called an abridgment of all the hadith from his teacher that was, he was asked to compile, right? He says that in his introduction. In fact, he has a long title of his book, you know, the, the Satan and the Prophet, which is a, an abridgment of the Sahih hadith. What he did, he started having a very, very strict methodology in terms of how he's going to authenticate. So strict that even though I, in other people's eyes, it's an authentic hadith, he had the strictest of criteria. So if you go to his, excuse me, hadith, we know that you can't be any stricter than that. Okay? So this is why it's the most rigorous, authentic collection of hadith. Okay, I was just curious because the hadith for him was written by him, not during the time of Muhammad though. Yeah, so Imam Bukhari came, you know, about 2nd, 3rd century, yeah. right? But where did he get his information from? He got his information from his teachers, who got his information from his teachers. They were all writing, right? People had written material. Oh. But in Islamic tradition, what happened is, this written material got incorporated into future materials. They got incorporated, copied and copied in, and, and, and in the future books. So, interesting enough, what we find, we have now a collection of hadiths called Sahifa Hammam ibn Munabbih. Okay? It's called a Sahifa, which predates Imam Bukhari, predates its collection. And if you now compare these collections of what Sahifa Hammam ibn Munabbih has, and compared to Imam Bukhari's collection, or the other collection that compared it, they're almost identical. Almost. So now you have a written material, documentary evidence to show how they were rigorous even in the form of writing. Because hadith can be transmitted in what we call ma'anawi, in meaning, or it can be transmitted lovely in verbatim way, words, exactly precise words. Yeah, that's yeah? what I was worried yeah? about. So the Prophet can explain and someone understood and then he passed on, you know what, the Prophet said this, his explanation. But we have hadith which are lovely, which they, they memorized the words of the Prophet and they then said, this is what the Prophet said. And they continued like this. And the Prophet warned the people like this, whoever intentionally lies against me, let him find his place in hellfire. Let him find his place in hellfire. That's why you'll find many of the companions, they were very reluctant to transmit the hadith. Because just in case they made this difference of word and so on, what he said. That's why you will see in our hadith tradition, 
we, we say like this. Or as he said, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or as he said. Because we want, we don't know exactly, because you can't really, you know, because this is a transmission, not like the Quran where you memorize to the vowel sound. Yeah. So yes, hadith has been authenticated like this. So this is indeed a source of guidance for us along with the Quran. I have one last question. No, no, carry I, on. Don't say I last. I apologize if it might be offensive because I don't understand. When you read the hadith of the Quran and you you are taught about paradise, is it in the Quran or in the hadith? About what? About paradise, paradise when you go. Paradise is described in the Quran in so many different places. Why? Because this is one of the things that people want to know. Where did I come from? What am I doing here? Where am I going to go? And fi so finally then, paradise, from what I've heard, and tell me if this is right or wrong. When a Muslim goes to paradise, will he be welcomed in by 72 virgins? Oh. So you've heard this. This is a statement from the Hadith literature. Oh, it is the Hadith. Yeah. Okay. okay. So it's not everyone's going to be welcomed by 72 virgins. Okay. Not everyone. There's a category of people who will receive this reward. But let's talk about what paradise is. Quran describes paradise as something that no eyes have seen, no ears have heard. So you can't really contemplate and comprehend what the paradise is. What God does in the Quran, He gives you something from this world and gives you similitude or similar similarities. So understand that, yes, just like you eat in paradise, here you will have this heavenly food in paradise. You will eat. But the heavenly food is not like the earthly food because the, the, the form and the reality of heaven is different. The food here that when we consume, it might give us some trouble, a stomach ache, for example, or a headache, right? The food of heaven will have none of those side effects. It is merely for your pleasure. You would not need to even you know, get rid of it like you do here, for example, today. So this is for a pleasure. What God has made, paradise a place of happiness, joy, pleasure and bliss. What do we understand as happiness and bliss? Companionship. We feel happy when we are in company. Company with your friends, your wife or your family, right? We feel happy. Yes, in paradise there will be companionship. So the Quran doesn't say Allah will take away from this kind of companionship because you already have been made in this way to understand this companionship makes you happy. So food, sometimes we will eat food just for the pleasure of it, not because they're hungry. Do you agree? Yes, but with, so do you agree? With, I agree. So with companionship, does that mean in paradise when you go there, if you do get there, you'll they will be, be married? So there will be companionship for you. So there will be companions where you will have relationship. Oh, okay. So Islam is not in a way saying, you know what, the happiness, only happiness is a spiritual one. No, you will have a physical happiness just like you have now in this world. Oh, it is not going to be taken away from you. But the happiness that awaits there, as I said, it's removed of all the bad things of this world. For example, people love to drink wine because they have pleasure from it. You know, the Arabs, before they became Muslims, they used to like have so much drinking. When Quran came eventually to say, don't drink, they poured down their barrels and it was like flooding. I'm just exaggerating, right? It was like this. This is how much they had. So the same people, the Quran came and Allah is telling them that the pleasure of this wine drinking is not going to be taken from you. You'll have that pleasure, but the wine of paradise is a wine just similarity only in names perhaps. It would not intoxicate you like the wine does today. Okay? It not befog your mind. It would not <coughs> excuse me, leave you with your hangovers or side effects. But you would have the pleasure. But then and I know I keep harping on this. Where did the virgins come from? Okay. God has told us in the Quran He's created a special creation. Okay? They will be from people in this world who will then accompany you, those who make it to heaven your family, your wife, yeah, and your companionship. But also God has made companions, Hur, a special creation. What are they called? Hur. Hur. Hur Na'in. Yeah, Hur. So this Hur has been created as a special privileged um, reward because God has created a lot of other things. A 
and this is another creation of God as a reward. People, man or woman, for example, they describe their organic needs. Let's keep it simple because children may be watching, right? So I'm not going to be very graphic. People have organic needs. This need is not going to be taken away from you. Because when you have this organic need and you fulfill this need, you feel happy, you feel bliss, you feel tranquil. I'm talking about this in intimate relationship, right? You will have this intimate relationship which will be provided to you. It's not going to be taken away from you. Okay? So this is God showing that yes, He will provide you levels of happiness and joy. But what awaits in heaven is more than that. More than that. This is just some examples that's given. In fact, the art, you know, you can say the, the you know the, the utmost bliss and happiness and joy and success is the pleasure of seeing Allah, the one who created us. And that is the supreme success and that is the highest reward. Unfortunately, the people who don't go to heaven will not have that. People in hellfire will never see God. They'll never see their maker. They will be in hellfire forever, you know, totally um, prohibited from this, this blessings of seeing God. So to be a good Muslim, to get into paradise, you follow the teachings in the Quran and you also follow the hadiths. You do both, then you go to paradise. Yeah. So paradise and the hadiths has to be either the one from Bukhari or No no hadith has to be authentic. Because there are other authentic hadiths elsewhere. As is I Bukhari said, Bukhari authentic. is one of I the said, authentic. As I said, yeah. Bukhari is all authentic, right? Okay. But there are other authentic hadiths. Bukhari, right. Bukhari was not interested to collect every single authentic hadith. That was his not uh, intention because he was asked to collect a small collection right. and his small collection he put the strictest criteria but there are so many other authentic collections now there is no new hadiths to discover hadiths are all been compiled they have been authenticated and we even have collection called mawdu'at you know fabricated hadith you can read a book these are all the forged hadiths these are all the ones fabricated hadith okay just to help all people that You'll be surprised to see that some of the hadiths, which are called unauthentic, the contents is actually the same. Imagine one of the hadith of the Prophet. Um, every action is by intention. Okay? That statement of the Prophet has been narrated by so many companions in Mutawatir hadith. Now imagine a liar, a person known to lie, he narrated the same statement. That hadith, even though it's the same statement, to us, is a fabricated hadith. We we'll reject it. Why we reject it? Because it's come from someone who's known to be a liar. But couldn't a Muslim make a mistake and read the wrong hadith and then not end up in paradise? Okay. So when we say read something wrongly, hadith is not to be read, hadith is to period. be understood and applied on your life. So when the hadith says, for example, okay, when you deal with people, always speak the truth. So did you understand what it says? It says, speak the truth always. So, if you speak the truth always, you are following this hadith. You are meant to apply the teaching in your life. So, if for example, you realize there is a creator who is one and only. You realize this creator is only one worthy of worship. He is Allah. And you realize Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God. And you realize his statement is there in the hadith. Your role is to then study learn, apply it in your lives, and then you live your life accordingly. If you did this, Allah has promised us that if you worshipped Allah, worshipping is following everything what Allah says, following the Prophet because the Prophet is explaining what Allah has said, demonstrating how to follow, how to obey Allah, then Allah promised us in, in the Quran that we will go to paradise. Okay. This is a promise of Allah. It's a, it's a guarantee. So for you, it's quite simple. If you are not a Muslim, you need to verify that Allah is the one only worthy of worship. You need to verify Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. You need to verify that the Quran is indeed the speech of Allah, the revelation of Allah. Once you do that, you have verified it. The next step is following it. Muslims, all of Muslims, they have done that already, right? Their job is to follow what Allah and His Messenger has said. And when you say Muslims have to follow, do you mean 
Sufis, Shiites, they all follow the same hadiths. Okay. Or do so they follow different whether hadiths? someone labels himself as a Sufi or a Shia or a Tabligi or something, look what, what, what the difference is. If the people that we are now labeled, mm -hmm. their belief is not based on the Quran mm -hmm. and the teaching of the Prophet, then they have no grounds to say okay. I'm going to be saved. Right. Because you can say I'm a Sufi, but I don't know, I have no need for the Quran. I have no need to do Salah, my prayer. I have no need to fast. That's it. You are doomed. Why? Because you somehow think, you know what? You can worship Allah within your own thoughts and in your own making. You can't do that. How, for example, I, I need to illustrate this. If you, sorry to um, uh, give you an explanation. You know, some people love football so much. They live football. They die football. Their pair of boots, they cherish than anything else. They will clean it to the minute cleaning and so on and put it there and so on. Now imagine you haven't had the chance to clean, right? You've had your boots and you left it. And now you want to show how much you love your wife. You want to give her a present. And you said, look, what is the most dearest thing to me? It's my football and my boots. Dearest. So what do you do? You said, no, no, I'm going to pack my boots and I'm going to give it to my wife. But imagine your wife doesn't like football. All the time you're watching, she says, okay, let's go out somewhere. Let's go to eat somewhere. We don't listen, so I have a match to play. Or I have a match to watch. So she didn't like football at all in the first place, right? She lets you play, she lets you watch, but she doesn't really love it. And you give her your smelly boots. Without asking her, does, is that what she loves and accepts? She might think and appreciate, but in her, you know, she doesn't love it. You will realize, okay, maybe, you know what, that wasn't the right thing to do. Maybe, instead of giving my smelly boots, which she doesn't appreciate anyway, she might just, for the spirit of the things, may understand that I am giving, showing some love, but still, smelly boots, right? You, could have, you should have asked her, or you should have known better, what does she love? So when it comes to worship, if I think, you know what, mm, God may be pleased with me worshipping in this way. You know what, I'm going to go to a lake and I'm going to immerse myself 30 times in the morning, 7 o'clock, 30 times in the evening, 7 o'clock. And then I'll come back and I'm going to start eating dirt because this is the creation of God. I'm going to start eating my own dirt. Sorry to use that example because that is real. That happened. It was in Channel 4 many years ago. This individual, Guru, he showed his love his worship by eating his own excrements. Sorry to use that example, but this is it. But the, the, the message is quite clear from it. Does he really think God wants this is how you should worship him? This is not the way to worship him, but you thinking the way, eating your own excrements? No. That is why God sent prophets and messengers to tell us how we should worship him. So one of the ways God has shown us is like you bow down and prostrate because this is how you can show your humility. Our head, do you know how when we stand like this in a fight, we don't bow down, we stand, you know, because we don't want to show our humbleness to our opponent. But when we want to show humility, we bow down. And is that, that in the Quran or the Hadith? Bowing down in the Quran is there, or prostration in the Quran. Allah says, you know, bow down and you prostrate to him. So the, the reasons why you're bound down and prostrating, the, the link is there of humility. We show we are utmost humble, left our pride and bow down. If you ask an atheist, put your head on the ground and worship the creator. No way, no way. So yes, when we talk about is the Sufi and the Shia and so on, are they going to go to heaven? If they follow the Quran and they follow the Sunnah of the Prophet, his teachings, then of course, people start labeling themselves because there's some kind of, you know, spiritual, political affiliation. I'm not, I'm not sure why. You should label yourself as a Muslim following the Sunnah of the Prophet, okay? Not a tablighi and so on and so forth. Maybe they identify yourself as this to show that, okay, we have a particular way of doing this. We all are going to follow the Quran and the Sunnah, but we have a particular way of program. So that's what they're probably doing. A Sufi might say, you know what, our program is, we're gonna to go to a gathering and we start making the 
uh, remembrance of Allah. They start saying Allah, 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 and so on, right? Now, one needs to ask, the form of glorification and remembrance of God that you are doing, is this what the Prophet did? Is this what the Prophet said to do? If it's not the case, then that's not acceptable. Worshipping God has to be done in the manner and the mode shown by the Prophet by Prophet Muhammad You can't just say, you know what, I'm going to pray by jumping and bouncing and doing a... What, what did he say? A somersault. somersault. Did the Prophet did that and show, he, did he do that and show this is how you're going to worship God? No. So I'm not going to invent things like this. So as you realize, to become a Muslim, this is your second step. I mean, we're talking about when you become a Muslim, this is the approach you're going to take. How about talking about, you know, what are your next step in becoming a Muslim? Because I'm sure you would not object to worshipping one God. I'm sure you're not going to object to worshipping one God through the teaching of the Prophet. No, no, I wouldn't object. It would just be to make sure that A, you're reading the Quran and making sure you're understanding and reading the correct yeah. hadith. So, would you ex accept that the best explanation is the explanation of the first few generations because they witnessed the explanation by the Prophet? They understood from the Prophet rather than today? The best explanation is the explanation of the Prophet and his companions? Would you agree? I don't know. I wouldn't be anywhere in, in, in that position to make that choice. If the Prophet explains something yeah. about the Quran, is his explanation better or someone today explaining this is what it means? Well, logically, it would be his Exactly, exactly. So we Muslims, we say the best explanation of the Quran is the explanation of the first three generations. The explanation of the Prophets and the companions of the Prophets and their students because they were the most closest in, in the touch of revelation. Okay. That's where any differences that we have, any disputes that we have, we should go to them. Yeah? But, yeah? So for you, for you now, do you agree that there is a creator? I don't know. Okay. What would convince you and make sure to you that there is indeed a creator of our universe? I would have to see something. Hmm? I would have to see it. See... I would have to see... See see what? Rather than believe on faith. Because I don't want to digress into that. No, no, no. The but reason I, why... I think this is an interesting topic. So at least we can, you know, work on the next steps. Because otherwise these are theoretical exercises. For you and for me, our salvation, meaning our success and our security in the hereafter lies I'll, in... I'll ask a basic question. Lies in... A basic question as a, someone who's following not the truth. Concerned. Does the Quran or the Hadith, <laughs> and you guys will probably love it, does it talk about dinosaurs? No. Why is that? Because perhaps, I'm giving you some perhaps explanation, no one inquired about them. And that's why the Quran doesn't talk about them. The Quran says God has created, let me tell you how this answer can be actually yes in one way. Allah says he created the cattle, the sheep and all those things and others of the creation that you don't know. Okay? You don't know. In Surah Al... Um, what Surah is it? And let me show you. Surah Al Nahal. Is this Surah 16? Okay. Al Bakhil. And then it says, and eat that, and the things that you didn't know, okay? Uh, okay. Yes, this is Surat al Nahal. So I'll show you this. You see, Surat al Nahal clearly. So here, Surah 16, this is in the very beginning. Allah says, here. He has created the heavens and the earth with the truth. How he be exalted above all the associate partners with him. He created in human beings from a nutfa, a drop, and he becomes an open opponent, right? And he created the cattle, 
<laughs> and he's created for them for you. In them is warmth and numerous benefits and of them that you eat. And there is beauty for you in them when you bring them and home in the evening and as you lead them forth to pasture in the morning. And they carry your loads. Yeah? And Wal Khail and Bigal and he created horses, mules and donkeys for you to ride as an adornment. And he creates other things of which you have no knowledge. So you can say God hasn't specifically dinosaurs. said dinosaurs, but he said there are many other things that we don't know. At that time did people know about dinosaurs? Very unlikely. At the time of in the seventh century Arabia, I don't think people knew about dinosaurs then in Arabia. In the Quran, there are many people who came and said about this and that. And the Quran says, they ask you, yes, alunaka and Dhul Qarnain, for example. They ask you about Dhul Qarnain, the two horned ones. They ask you about this, they ask you about that, and the Quran then gives them the answer. So, yes, if people asked, perhaps the answer would have been given. So, we do not say that dinosaurs are non existent because God has created so many different creations. And dinosaurs, we have clearly seen evidence of their remnants left behind. To uh, the Christians, um, when Jesus Christ was born, there was a star that they saw and he was led to Bethlehem. I know within what little I know of Islam, I know that Jesus is regarded as a prophet, one of the prophets. Yeah. Is that mentioned in the Quran? The Quran clearly says he is a servant of God, a prophet of God, a messenger of God. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The Quran addresses the Jewish Christian people and saying, you know, O people of the book, do not transgress. Jesus, the son of Mary, was no more than a messenger. Yeah. Many messengers passed before him. So he was a messenger of God. He did not claim to be God. He instead said, worship my God and your Lord. That is the straight path. The Quran says, do not say God is Jesus or Jesus is God. Do not say Trinity, that God is Trinity. This is, is better for you, for your God, your Lord is one God. The Quran even says, look, the heavens and the earth is about to split asunder. The mountains to crumble when people ascribe a son to God. It is not befitting that God should have a son. It is not appropriate or proper or befitting that the most high, the most glorious, the most you know, supreme God should have a son. Whenever he wants to do something, create something, he just see, says be and it is. So why do people ascribe a son to God? This is, this is a grievous thing to do. So yes, Christianity has transgressed their limits. Christians in their belief about Jesus, about God, has transgressed the limits. Thank you very much for taking time to talk to me. That's basically all I have to ask. Okay. So. so perhaps we can talk another time about, you know, what steps we can take then to accept well, that there is a creator and the creator is Allah. Absolutely, I'm, I'm open to it. Yeah, so let's leave it there for now. It's nice to talk into you. Pleasure to meet you. Um, press. Preston. Preston. Okay. Preston. okay. Yeah. We'll talk again. Preston. 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 If Brother Preston, Brother Preston, if you believe in one God and if you believe in the prophets, so why didn't you just take the first step? Well, well, I know, I believe. This is, I don't want to say anything offensive. I believe in the, the possibility that there might be a creator. But I don't want to go further than that because I don't believe at the moment that the relig religions point us to the truth. I think man has corrupted the scriptures. So, some. Yes, some. So we're not looking. Yes. Yeah. So, so we can I talk do. about it. We can yeah. talk about the Quran, whether the Quran is corrupted or not. Because if we now are able to demonstrate the Quran has been transmitted to us from God without any corruption, you have this conviction that yes, I can be certain about at least about this Quran. So this will be our next perhaps um, topic of discussion. We can talk. Sure, okay? absolutely. Thanks very much.